is a well-known author and a historian and a nationally known speaker, and most of you know him well, and so I want you just to give him a warm welcome as he comes to share with us tonight. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you. I also want to just say this, that we are going to be receiving an offering at the end of the night, so I want to let you know that ahead of time. And uh, the, what you're saying tonight may or may not <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. I just I want you all job. to be prepared that that's what we're going to do at the end. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, and it is a tremendous honor for me to be here. And I also want to let you know how much I respect Pastor James Weaver. And uh, let's give the Lord a hand for such tremendous pastors right here. And I'm going to ask Randy Melchert to come up. And Randy is um, the, uh, and borrow the mic there, because I don't have the mic. Um, he's with VCY Radio. And VCY has over 100 stations and affiliates across the country. And, and Randy, tell us a little bit about VCY. Sure. VCY is a Christian radio network. We're excited to be here in the Des Moines area. We're in Des Moines on 99.3 FM, out by uh, Iowa, by Pella, Iowa, Ottumwa on 89.7. We are in the middle of a 10-week, of a 10-stop tour in two weeks. So we'll be in almost 10 different states in the two weeks as well. But we're excited to travel with Bill Federer to be able to bring this powerful message to you. We're so thankful, especially to your pastor as well, for opening up the doors. Excited to travel with, with uh, Brother Bill on the trip. And, and you can get at the table the free, how many years has VCY Radio been in existence? 60 years. So we've got a 60th anniversary magazine that's for free. We have cards as well if you want to tell people about it. And we have bumper stickers that you can slap on your neighbor's car when they're not looking. <laughs> and, and I want to point out, now, now uh, Randy is amazing. He started the largest private school in Wisconsin. And he has a th like hundreds and hundreds of inner city Milwaukee kids go to the school that he started. And, um, uh, but, but, you know, I always love stories where it starts humbly and then it grows big. And so tell how VCY Radio got started. So VCY Radio, three teenagers back in the day said, you know what, it'd be cool if we could have a radio program. And so they went to every station in town and, well, we don't know where it'll fit in our schedule. So they went, they prayed with their Bible club director. It was Youth for Christ Milwaukee at the time. They knelt and prayed. Three days later, somebody came driving into the, the low-rent district of Milwaukee, because if you're in ministry, that's where you start out. And there they prayed. And three days later, somebody comes walking in the door. Anybody here want some free airtime? And Vic, the founder, raised his head and said, we just prayed three days ago. Went from a uh, daily half-hour program, hour program, to now where we're on over 60 stations full-time. We're thankful to God for opening the doors. Yeah, and then there's lots of affiliate stations, too. Affiliate stations as well. Uh, missions work we've been able to work with. Christian radio stations in Baghdad, Iraq, of all places, that are taking the good news around the world. Yeah, thank God. Thank you, Randy. And so you can pray and ask God to give you an idea to let you be used by the Lord, and he'll do miracles for you, too. So, so my talk tonight is going through some of these stories. And I, I, my wife and I put them together in some books called Miracles in American History. So the King of England was a globalist. He was a one world government guy with him at the top. The sun never set on the British Empire. They had India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, British Guyana, Canada, Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, and America. And America's founders decided they didn't like a globalist, one world government king telling us what to do. They broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. And so we call it the Revolutionary War. And uh, the Declaration of Independence, by the way, is key in us breaking away from the king. The Declaration mentions God four times. Laws of nature and of nature's God. All men are, are created equal. The king of England did not believe everyone was created equal. He believed he was created a little extra special. It's called the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king. I'm the intermediary between God above and these lowly subjects below. And, and the, God rules through me and, and, and kings rule through fear. And, and then it says that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That verse right there skips the king. It says we believe all men are created equal and that this creator gives the rights to each person. It doesn't give them to the king who dispenses it to the people. It gives it to each person. 
And then we appeal to the supreme judge of the world. And uh, that's an important verse because you lose a court case, you appeal it. You lose a court case, you appeal it. Well, in England, the, you, you appeal to the highest would be the king. Well, our founders were saying, we're going above the king's head. <laughs> we're going to appeal to the supreme judge of the world and with the reliance on the protection of divine providence. So um, we go through lots of different stories. But after the declaration was read to George Washington's troops, he gave this order. The general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. Later, uh, there's the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. And uh, again, this is the most powerful military on the planet. They fill up the New York Harbor with 400 ships, 32,000 British troops, cannons, gunpowder, and um, it looked like a forest of trees because of all these masts of these ships. And uh, the Continental Congress has a day of fasting. We earnestly recommend the 17th of May, 1776, be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer uh, that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. Two things I want to point out. They realize that God cannot bless us while we're in sin, because if he was blessing us while we're in sin, he would, in a sense, be giving consent to the sin. And if he gives consent to sin, he denies his just nature, and he can't do that. So they realized that we had to bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and that by sincere repentance, and then through what? Through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. And so George Washington uh, orders his troops to observe that day of fasting. He writes to his younger brother, we expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We are neither in men or arms prepared for it. If our cause is just, as I do most religiously believe it to be, the same providence which has in many instances appeared for us will still go on to afford us its aid. And uh, by, the word, the, by the way, the word providence in Webster's 1828 dictionary says the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures by divine providence is understood God himself. So it was just an old fashioned respectful way of saying God. And um, so let's go back to this battle of Brooklyn Heights. The British fill up the harbor and the, they're the redcoats and the Americans are the blue. There was a loyalist and he shows the British where to land where the Americans won't see. And he marches them all night long through Jamaica Pass. And they attack George Washington from behind on August 27th of 1776. This is the largest battle of the entire Revolutionary War. And this is the entire American army. If we lose it here, it's over. The British attack and 3,000 Americans are killed, only 300 British. And George Washington watches from a distance where the 400 young men in the 1st Maryland Regiment charged directly into the British lines to buy time for the rest of the army to regroup. All of them get killed, and he's seeing it from a distance. He says, good God, what brave fellows I have lost this day. Well, then the sun goes down, and Washington is pinned up against the river because the British were attacking him from behind, and he was facing the river. And so it looks pretty bad. I bet the thought was going through Washington's mind that the next day he'll be captured and hung as a traitor, and America will be another British colony in their global empire, uh, which, you know, India, Australia, and Kenya, and Uganda. And so, but Washington has an idea. He gets every boat he can find, and he ferries his troops across the East River to Manhattan Island. All night, as silent as they can do it, in pitch black, and they're just sneaking cannons and horses and everything across the East River. And then the sun starts to come up and he has only moved half the army. Now he's a sitting duck. There's not enough troops to fight. And all the British have to do is, you know, shoot a couple cannonballs and it'll mess up the boats going across. And his chief of intelligence, Major Ben Talmadge, writes, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river and seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential, providential occurrence perfectly well. 
and so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. Well, he continues to move the troops, and he's on the last boat that leaves. The fog lifts, the British charge, and no one's there. It was the last chance the British had to capture the entire American army all at once. Washington writes, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in the course of the war that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. When he stop being general, he'll be a preacher, right? And uh, then another is the Battle of Saratoga. <clears throat> now the British landed in Canada and they're coming down the Hudson River Valley toward Albany, the capital. And um, the British general, gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, has 6,000 troops. He meets with the Mohawk Indians and promises them money for scalps. The Indians and the Americans had sort of reached an equilibrium. They were getting along. When the British go to the Indians and stir them up, and the Indians knew the forest, and they would attack the Americans. 30 guys would go out at night to do reconnaissance. Three would come back because the Indians would capture them and kill them. And so the, um, the loyalist, David Jones, he's loyal to Britain, lives in New York, and he is engaged to a girl named Jane McCrae. And he kisses her goodbye, goes off and joins the British. They're marching toward the area, and he's probably looking forward to seeing his fiance again. Well, the Indians are out there scalping in front of the British Army, and the Indians can't tell who's a loyalist and who's an American patriot. We all sort of look the same to them. <laughs> and so the Indians go in, and uh, they're scalping people, and uh, they do their scalp dances where they put the scalp on a stick. And, and um, so they go to uh, this area, and they scalp Jane McCrae. And they take her scalp, and they're doing their scalp dances. And the British camp, this David Jones, sees this nice, pretty long hair, and he recognizes it as his fiance's. And so the British soldiers go to this general, and they say, what were you thinking? And so he has to meet with the Indians and tell them to tone it down. The Indians don't know tone it down. They know on and off. <laughs> they're at war or they're at peace. And when it's war, it's total war. They don't know any limited warfare. Like we would tell our troops, you know, if you're in Iraq and you're shooting at the enemy and, and then they wait till they cross the street and set up and start shooting at you again, you know, it's like, no, the Indians is total. And so they leave. The Indians get insulted and leave. Well, they were the eyes and ears of the British soldiers. So now you have 6,000 British soldiers in the middle of the dense New York forest, and they don't know where they're at. Now the Americans get the advantage, and they surround the British and uh, capture 6,000 of them. And uh, it's called the Battle of Saratoga. And so here's the, uh, the British General Johnny Burgoyne surrendering his um, sword to the Americans, and it ricochets around the world. And Ben Franklin is over in, Brit in, in the France, and he's able to go into the King Louis XVI's court and say, we just captured 6,000 British. And the King of France was like, you know, we lost the French and Indian War, so I'm not in a hurry to get into another war with Britain. But if you're thinking about, if you're captured 6,000, maybe I'll, I'll get involved. Once France got involved, what went from a local suppressing a rebellion war now turned into a global war because the French and the British had colonies in India, in Indonesia, in Africa. And so the British had to sp spread all their military force around the world. And um, it was a very important victory. Washington writes to his brother, John Augustine, I most devoutly congratulate my country and every well-wisher to the cause on this signal stroke of providence. And then the Continental Congress says, the first national day of Thanksgiving after the declaration. It says, with one heart and one voice, join the penitent confession of their manifold sins, right, we see that again, that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ, mercifully to forgive and blot them out, 
and under the providence of Almighty God secure for these United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence and peace. And then we got Valley Forge and Washington gives the order to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. And then in 1779, some of the Delaware Indian chiefs bring some of their youth to George Washington to be trained in American schools. And Washington tells them, you do well to wish to learn our arts and way of life and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. And then we have Benedict Arnold. Now, Benedict Arnold was the hero of the Battle of Saratoga, right? He led a flanking charge. He got wounded in the leg, but he came away with the glory from the battle. And he's wounded, so he has to be laid up in uh, Philadelphia while he's healing. And he's made the military governor of Philadelphia, which means that he can confiscate goods for the sake of the army, right? But he was confiscating goods and there was accusations that he was profiting off of it. Meanwhile, he's going to all these parties and he meets um, Peggy Shippen, who's the daughter of a loyalist. And uh, they get married and uh, he sort of stretches and buys a big house for her because she's used to nice stuff, but he doesn't have the money, but somehow he gets the money. So that's why they think that he's Say, you know, selling stuff on the side. Anyway, uh, he has to go through a court martial and uh, he comes out OK. But his wife, Peggy Shippen, says those Americans don't appreciate you. If you were in the British Army, they they would know what a great guy you were and they would never put you through this. And so she talks Benedict Arnold into being a traitor. Now, Benedict Arnold has made the commander at West Point because his leg's doing better. And uh, he agrees to betray West Point to the British. And he meets with a spy, John Andre. And uh, they're on the coast uh, or the the shores of the Hudson River. And the British ship gets fired upon by the Americans. And so it leaves. And so now this John Andre spy cannot get back onto the ship. And so uh, Benedict Arnold says, well, come back and I'll dress you in some civilian clothes and you can sneak back across land. Now, this is dangerous because if you're captured in a uniform, you get to stay alive because they can use you later for a prisoner swap. If you're captured as a spy dressed in civilian clothes, you're immediately killed. And so uh, Benedict Arnold talks this guy into putting on um, uh, civilian clothes. And then historian says, why did he do that? And they think, well, he was keeping in touch with the wife, Peggy Shippen. And so the thought was that Benedict Arnold was a little jealous of this guy. And and who knows? Um, So West Point is on the Hudson River. And if you can control West Point, you can control the river. Well, the Hudson River cuts America in half back then with the New England on one side, middle southern colonies on the other. And so Benedict Arnold agrees to betray West Point. That's it today. And uh, So the John Andre spy, dressed as a civilian, is walking across American land, no man's land, and he's one bridge away from going onto the British land with the information and they could do their, you know, capture of West Point. Right before he crosses the bridge, some guys come out of the woods dressed as German Hessians. Now, the German Hessians were hired by the British to fight the Americans. If Benedict Arnold had kept his mouth shut, he could have crossed the bridge. But instead, he blurts out, it's good to finally see some men on our side. And the soldiers are like, what do you mean our side? Well, you're German Hessians. You must be with the British. He goes, no, no, no. We're Americans dressed as German Hessians to try to find spies. And and, uh, he's like, you know what? I I thought of that. I I can never tell nowadays. He tries to talk his way out of it. They say, well, just explain it to our boss. So they take him and, um, and they decide to search him. And they search him once, search him twice. They're about to let him go. They take off his boot. And in the heel of his boot, he has the map of West Point. And so there's the picture. Here he is again with his boot off. And they're looking at this map. And, and um, so they take him to their commanding officer. Meanwhile, the word gets back to West Point to Benedict Arnold 
that we just caught this spy who was about to betray your fort. And he's like, oh, thanks. And so he flees on a ship called the Vulture, right? The British had a ship waiting. And uh, the next day, American General Nathaniel Green writes, treason of the blackest eye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, was about to give the American cause a deadly wound, if not fatal stab. Happily, the treason had been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. The providential train of circumstances which led to its discovery affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. Anyway, so then Continental Congress has another day of Thanksgiving. Then the remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing the person of our commander in chief, because George Washington was going to be visiting that day, an army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. It is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness. There's that confession again, and to offer fervent supplications to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. I just think it's sort of interesting that here they are thanking God that West Point wasn't captured, thanking God that George Washington wasn't captured. Oh, we want to thank God that the knowledge of Christianity spreads over all the earth. And then there is the battle of cow pens. You have some cows, put them in a pen. That's what the name is in South Carolina. I've actually spoken right around there. The British have a Colonel Tarleton, 26 year old, and he's nicknamed the butcher. He's really good at riding horses and uh, he leads the dragoons, which are these light cavalry and they don't carry much supplies, but they can ride really fast. And uh, at the Battle of Waxhaw, the Americans were surrendering. He orders his dragoons to go in there and they hack the Americans to death, hundreds of them. They're like surrendering. It's like, we don't care. And if you saw the movie, The Patriot with Mel Gibson, the, he, this guy's portrayed in there, this Colonel Tarleton. Anyway, so Tarleton is uh, chasing the American General Daniel Green. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Daniel Morgan. And they're coming up and the Americans have a supply wagons. It's, they're really slow and they cannot outrun these light cavalry. And so the American general, Daniel Green, decides he's got to fight, but he picks where. And he picks a spot right in front of a river. Now, if you're ever fighting, you never want to pick a spot in front of a river because if you're losing, it makes it really hard to run away. So it looked foolish, but he did it on purpose because he wanted to entice this 26 year old uh, Tarleton to to attack. So the Tarleton's been riding 24 hours nonstop. His men are tired. He sees these Americans set up in front of a river and he goes, what fools? He goes, men, take out your sabers and they charge. Well, he had two groups of men. The first were called militia. They're straight off the farm and they're known for shooting a couple times and running away. And behind them are the Continental soldiers who won't run away. And so the British are charging. They're the redcoats and the blue is the Americans. They shoot a couple times, run away. And the, the other ones pretend like they're going to run, run away. And then at the last minute, they stop, they turn, they lower their rifles and at point blank range. They shoot and kill 100 British dragoons. And the ones that ran away, they just went in a circle and attacked the British from the side. And then 800 of the British throw down their weapons and surrender. And this Colonel Tarleton rides off. And when word gets to Lord Cornwallis that his dragoons were killed and captured, I mean, these were like his toughest troops. He was leaning on his sword. He leaned so hard, the sword snapped in half. And so Tarleton decides to chase the Americans and he is following him. The Americans are joined by General Nathaniel Green and uh, they get to the Catawba River coming between South Carolina to North Carolina and the uh, Americans cross before the British can, can cross. There's a storm, a flash flood. The river rises over the banks and the British are delayed several days. The British cross again. They're chasing the Americans. The Americans cross the Yadkin River. The British show up and they're watching the Americans get out the other side. But before the British can start crossing another flash flood. The river rises over the banks. They have to they're delayed a couple more days and it happens a third time at the Dan River crossing from North Carolina into Virginia. Here's the historical marker. 
Boyd's and Irwin's ferries to the west were used by Nathaniel Green in his passage of Dan River in mid-February 1781, while Cornwallis was in close pursuit. And the British commander Henry Clinton wrote, here the royal army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen almost miraculously to let the enemy over, who could not else have eluded Lord Cornwallis's grasp so close was he upon their rear. So here is one of these British guys saying, man, this is almost miraculous that they got across and then we stopped. And so Yale President Ezra Stiles writes, should we not ascribe to a supreme energy, talking about God, the wise generalship of, by uh, General Green leaving the roving Cornwallis to pursue his helter-skelter ill-fated march into Virginia. And then Washington writes, we have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions in our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence for all other resources seem to have failed us. Anyway, I'm gonna skip past some stuff for the sake of time. A lot of quotes where um, uh, they, they acknowledge God. Here's Sam Adams. There are instances of an almost astonishing providence in our favor. And he says, our success has staggered our enemies and almost given faith to infidels so that we may truly say it is not our own arm which has saved us. The hand of heaven appears to have led us on to be perhaps humble instruments and means in the great providential dispensation which is completing. And uh, then the Treaty of Paris, when the war's over. Did you know that the treaty that ended the Revolutionary War started off in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity? It having pleased divine providence to dispose the hearts of King George, right? To forget all past misunderstandings and then done at Paris, third day of September, year of our Lord, 1783. Um, and then we're gonna jump forward to the, um, the War of 1812. Again, a lot of great quotes. I like this one from Reagan. In this country of ours took place the greatest revolution that has ever taken place in the world's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another. Here, for the first time in all the thousands of years of man's relation to man, the Founding Fathers established the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and ability to determine our own destiny. So here we are, thousands of years of world's history. Something unique happened in America. Instead of top down through kings that rule through fear, it's bottom up. We get to determine our own destiny. In a sense, you get to be the king of your own life with a little K. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-king. You're a citizen of America. You're a co-king of America. A republic is where the citizens are king, ruling through representatives. So we pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. And so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system where I participate in ruling myself. It's like, okay, somebody else will tell you what to do. So America, we took the power of a king and we gave it to the people. And uh, here's Ralph Waldo Emerson. America appears like a last effort of divine providence in behalf of the human race. And then I want to throw in a story that during this time, there's the first great awakening revival taking place. And one of the people that, that got saved during this revival was a black man named George Lyle, 23-year-old slave, heard the gospel during the Great Awakening. And he wrote, I saw my own condemnation in my own heart. I found no way wherein I could escape only the damnation of hell, only through the merits of my dying Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he is attending a church with his master, Buckhead Creek Baptist Church, and the master was Henry Sharp. And he gets saved and he starts preaching and he preaches so good that his master frees him. And then George Lyle organizes a church, right, of slaves and of free slaves. And it's the Silver Bluff Baptist Church in Beach Island, South Carolina, 1773. It's considered one of the very, very first black congregations in America. And uh, then he moves to Savannah, Georgia, where he meets in uh, Jonathan Bryan's barn. And Jonathan Bryan is a slave owner, but he lets him meet in his barn. And then one of Jonathan Bryan's slaves gets saved, Andrew Bryan. 
because slaves would often take the last name of their master. So Andrew Bryan is converted and his master frees him. And so he's now pastoring this church that's meeting in this barn. And then they moved to another building and they changed the name to the first Bryan Baptist Church. And uh, it ends up in, by 1802 having 700 members, first African Baptist Church. And out of this church, George Lyle uh, decides that he's going to be a missionary. And so he, in 1792, gets on a boat and goes to Jamaica. And he ends up preaching in Jamaica and uh, gets 8,000 people converted and starts dozens of Baptist churches. And so this is all happening during this Revolutionary War time, right? This revival taking place. And he's considered the first American sent out as a foreign missionary. This is 20 years before Adoniram Judson goes to Burma. And, um, and then we have another war, and it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. And so that's why we look at these crises in the past. It's called the War of 1812. The British defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Trafalgar. So the British have the undisputed most powerful navy in the world, and they send some of their navy to Lake Erie. And uh, the president is James Madison, and he has a day of prayer to be observed September 9th, 1813. Render him thanks, acknowledging the transgressions which might justly provoke his divine displeasure, seeking his merciful forgiveness with the reverence for the unerring precept of our holy religion to do unto others as they would require that others should do to them. Well, that's what date is that? That's September 9th. Guess what happened the next day? The uh, uh, Captain Oliver Hazard Perry, 28 years old, on September 10th of 1813, he confronts the British squadron on Lake Erie. And uh, strong winds prevent Perry from getting into a safe position. The British have long range cannons. They're splintering Oliver Hazard Perry's flagship to pieces. He gets on a second ship. Most of Perry's crew are free blacks from Ohio. And they had to drag the boat even into Lake Erie because we didn't have a port. And um, so the British are using long range cannons, splintering his ship, and they thought he was going to surrender. Instead, he gets on a boat, goes to his second ship called the Niagara, and then the wind changes directions. And the British ships have to turn around. And as the British ships are turning around, they're too close and they get their sails entangled. And they are not mess trying to untangle these things. And in 15 minutes, Oliver Hazard Perry sails his ship by like a madman. He's firing every cannon, boom, 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 boom. And when the dust, when the, when the wind blows all the smoke away, he had disabled the entire British squadron. And so uh, Perry tells the men on deck, he says, uh, the, the prayers of my wife are answered. <laughs> and then he writes to the Secretary of Navy, it has pleased the Almighty to give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. The British squadron, consisting of two ships, two brigs, one schooner, one sloop, have this moment surrendered to the force of my command after a sharp conflict. And then the president, James Madison, writes, it has pleased the Almighty to bless our arms. On Lake Erie, the squadron under the command of Captain Perry, having met the British squadron of superior force, a sanguinary, which means bloody, conflict ended in the capture of the whole. This was an important battle. Why? Because it allowed America to take Detroit, and once it got Detroit, it took back the whole Northwest Territory, out of which seven states were formed. And, um, and then, uh, so another of the War of 1812, uh, after the Battle of Lake Erie, in 1814, the British march into Washington, D.C. This time, the American troops just run away, and the British just flat out walk into our capital. James Madison is out on the field directing troops and his wife, Dolly Madison, is in the, the White House and they were about to have dinner and she sees everybody's running out of town. And so she has them take the painting of George Washington, the only one that Washington was present, you know, right? And um, they, have, they take it down, she cuts it out of the frame, rolls it up and she's riding out of town in a carriage while the British ride into town. The British Admiral George Cockburn rides up to the, White, to the White House, goes inside, sees the table set with food, sits down, eats the food, and then sets 
the White House on fire and then sets the Capitol on fire. And uh, then he uh, goes and sets. Uh, by the way, he goes to the Capitol building and he goes to the podium and, he's, and he has his men sitting there. He goes, who votes to burn the American Capitol? And they go, I. <laughs> And then they burn the Treasury and the Library of Congress. They attack the Navy Yard and our U.S. Capitol is going up in flames. And uh, meanwhile, the winds pick up and the winds grow to a frightening roar. And then lightning begins striking the British troops and the tornadoes knocking off roofs and chimneys on the British. And then even the tornado picked up British cannons and dropped them yards away. And then the uh, British Admiral George Cockburn exclaims to a lady, great God, Madame, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed to in this infernal country? To which the lady replied, no, sir, this is a special interposition of Providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> and then the British flee back to their ships over roads with downed trees, only to find two of their ships were blown ashore. And the rest of them had damaged riggings and the rains come and extinguish the fires. And um, a British historian wrote more British soldiers were killed by this stroke of nature than from all the firearms the American troops had mustered in the feeble defense of their city. And so the president, James Madison, writes the enemy, by a sudden incursion, has succeeded in invading the capital of the nation. During their possession, though for a single day only, they wantonly destroyed public edifices. Independence is now to be maintained with the strength and resources which heaven has blessed. And then he goes on, the two houses of the national legislature expressed that in the present time of public calamity and war, a day may be recommended by the people of the United States as a day of public humiliation and fasting and prayer to Almighty God. Imagine that a president declaring a day of fasting, his blessings on their arms, a speedy restoration of peace, of confessing their sins. We keep saying that and transgressions and strengthening his vows of repentance that he would graciously be pleased to pardon all their offenses. I deem it proper to recommend a day of humble adoration to the great sovereign of the universe. And um, these are stories that we put together in a book. And uh, just real quick, we're going to fast forward to World War I. The president is Woodrow Wilson. He uh, orders the troops to observe the Sabbath, the sacred rights of Christian soldiers. And then Woodrow Wilson has, guess what? A day of fasting in time of uh, May 11th, 1918. In time of war, humbly to acknowledge our dependence on Almighty God and to implore his aid and protection, a day of public humiliation, prayer, and fasting. Exhort fellow citizens of all faiths and creeds to assemble that day in their places of worship to pray Almighty God that he may what? Forgive our sins. And so uh, he has New Testaments and he writes the foreword to it. And so we got World War I. And one story is the Americans had a battalion pinned down by machine gun fire in the Decauville rail line of North Chatel Chere, France. And there was Sergeant Alvin York. And he writes, the Germans got us. They stopped us dead in our tracks. Their machine guns were up there on the heights overlooking us well hidden. We couldn't tell for certain where the terrible heavy fire was coming from. Those machine guns were spitting fire, cutting down undergrowth all around me. All but eight were killed. Sergeant York was from the uh, Kentucky backwoods and he hunted. And so he uh, started picking off the machine gunners one by one by one. And uh, he took out 32 of them. He killed 28 of the enemy. After he was shooting them, they wouldn't keep, they wouldn't lift their heads up and he would make a turkey call, gobble, gobble, gobble. And the people would lift their head up, boom, he'd shoot them. <laughs> and then there were, there were six Germans behind him and they are charging him. And he turns around with his pistol and he says, I, I shot him the way you shoot turkey. You shoot the furthest away one first. Because if you shoot the closest one, the other ones will see it and scatter and you'll never get them. And uh, and so people doubted the story. And so years later, they went over there with a the metal detector. And sure enough, they went to that area and they found this one area. It's all these spent shells all around it. And um, he gets the Congressional Medal of Honor 
he says, some of them officers been saying that I being a mountain boy and accustomed to the woods, done all these things the right way just by instinct. I had never got much learning from books except by the Bible. Maybe my instincts are more natural, but that ain't enough to account for the way I come out alive with all those German soldiers raining death on me. I'm a telling you, the hand of God must have been in that fight. Just think of them, 30 machine guns raining fire on me, point blank range, only 25 yards, and then them and their rifles and pistols, those bombs, and then those men charged with fixed bayonets, and I never was even a scratch, and bringing 132 prisoners. So the German commander like lifts up a little white flag, <laughs> and he marches 132 of them out, and, and out of the woods there's Sergeant Alvin York and maybe another guy crawls out and, uh, and the, the German commander's like, uh, how many of you are there? <laughs> it was just the two of them. And they're not about to run away because they know he's a sharpshooter and he'll get them. And so he marches them into the American camp. And uh, anyway, Sergeant York says, I have, only, I, I have got only one explanation that God must have heard my prayers. And why do we tell these stories? Because when we go through crises, we can get faith by saying, wait a second, we're a country, we've been through crises before. Let's trust God. Let's get out there. Let's have faith. He comes back to America and Sergeant Alvin York started a Bible school. And then Gary Cooper did a movie featuring him and so forth. And just an amazing story. And I, I got Eddie Rickenbacker and I tell more and more stories of World War II and, and um, the uh, Battle of... Uh, Oh, Dunkirk, and, and then here's a, a quote from Franklin Roosevelt. Preservation of these rights is vitally important to us now to enjoy them and to the whole future of Christian civilization. And, um, and then we got Pearl Harbor, and then we uh, got the Philippines, and we leave the Philippines, and then D General Doug Douglas MacArthur, to the weeping mothers of its dead, I can only say that the sacrifice and halo of Jesus and Nazareth had descended upon their sons, and God will take them to himself. And, and uh, anyway, the, the time's running away. So I'm going to skip past. We got Battle of Midway. All these stories are in the book. Um, we have um, this one D-Day. And it's the largest invasion force in world history. And um, Franklin Roosevelt gives a prayer. And the, um, uh, he gives out New Testaments. He writes the foreword as commander in chief. I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all serving the armed forces. And... Um, and then General Eisenhower, he's going to um, have, it's the Battle of the Bulge. And so the Americans are pinned down at a city called Bastogne, where eight roads come together and the Nazis are surrounding them. And coming to the rescue is, uh, is Patton. But Patton is pinned down um, by the weather. So the British surround the Americans, and the Americans have a general named Anthony McAuliffe, and the Germans send a a messenger to General McAuliffe and says, you're surrounded, surrender. And McAuliffe gives a one word answer, nuts. <laughs> and you can just imagine the German messenger coming back. Well, what does this American general say? He says nuts. <laughs> Is that yes? Is that no? <laughs> anyway, so Patton gets his chaplain, James O'Neill, to compose a prayer, prints it on a quarter of a million index cards, passes them out to the soldiers. They pray the prayer. My, my father-in-law was in a nursing home and the guy in the room next to him had been in Patton's army and he had a copy of this card with this prayer on it. And there, there it is. And it says, um, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness, restrain these immoderate reigns, hearken to us as soldiers, establish thy justice among the nations. Well, guess what? The, the next day the sky clears, the planes can fly and give cover, the Americans come to the rescue of the 101st Airborne at Beston, and the, the Nazis run out of gas. I talked to a guy that had fought there. He says they were as close as that field, and all of a sudden their tanks just run out of gas. And then they retreat, and then a couple months later, uh, Hitler blows his brains out there in uh, Berlin. And so these are times when our, uh, there's crisis, we pray, things turn around. You know, I, uh, I talk about American history, we talk about world history, but I wanted to end with this one thought. Why did God make us anyway? You know, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Tiny spot, nothing there. The, size was, the spot was the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Teeny little spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that spot 
was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. And this is the picture. This is not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And now with the James Webb telescope, they can see it even clearer. And they saw the red shift. Light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest wave, red being the slowest, longest wave. The red shift means you're seeing the slow light. These galaxies are moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2 18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large, if you were to place Stevenson 2 18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? What could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing, except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks, hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. So in the context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally created one tiny thing. He does not control your will. Now he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he doesn't need our love. He's not incomplete and our love somehow completes him. He doesn't need our love, but he wants it. It's like parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But he will never force you. Because the moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him. And he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. He wants your love, but he's not going to force you to love him. And you're made in his image. What's the most important thing in your life? Somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. Could it be that loving and being loved is a big deal to God? He loves everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? Galaxies can't love, rocks can't love, animals follow instinct. I looked at the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Not one time is the word love used to describe an angel's relationship with God. And the angels, word angel means messenger. And they deliver God's messages to Ezekiel and Daniel and Mary. And they deliver God's judgments in Egypt and to the Moabites and Midianites and all those ites. And they're heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. And they rejoice when a sinner converts. And uh, they worship God. They glorify God. They praise God. But they are not made in God's image. And Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They are mighty beings. They're incom incomprehensibly intelligent beings. But they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not powerful, we're not very smart. You know, a king can have a castle with really powerful soldiers and really brilliant staff, and then he can have children. Guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91, because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. 
Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings uniquely created with the ability to love God back. But for our love to be loved, it must be voluntary. He will never force us because the moment he would force us to love him, he himself would know he's forcing us to love him, and he would know our response is not a love response, so he'll never force you. He wants your love, but he's not going to force you. There's a second thing. How can God give us free will to love him back, but still be in control of everything? God created light. And light is a photon, which is a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field that travels at 186,000 miles per second. And visible light is one small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You have ultraviolet rays and infrared rays and gamma rays and radio waves. And so when God said, let there be light, he stretched out the heavens. He stretched out this electromagnetic field along with everything else. And Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you could travel approaching the speed of light, for you, time would slow down. And if you could travel the speed of light, for you, time would stand still. God created light. He's faster than light. So for God, time stands still? We'll never comprehend that. But there is a verse in the Bible that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we are living in slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. When you're in God's presence, you cannot think about the past. You cannot think about the future. You can't even think. You just experience. I'm in the presence of all power and all beauty and all love overwhelming. So for God to create our reality, he had to create a space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. So we think of the speed of light as fast. To God, it's slow. In physics, it's called the speed of causality, and it's the delay between cause and effect. It's the fastest two points in the universe can communicate in a vacuum. So in other words, God took now and stretched and slowed it down. <laughs> so why is that important? We get to make our little free will decisions in time, but he's outside of time. He can readjust every electron in the universe before time moves to the next nano frame forward so that his will is going to take place. It's our limited free will inside the context of his unlimited sovereign will. You know, if you have GPS on your phone, you make a wrong turn, it recalculates. What if the guy in the car next to you is making a wrong turn? His is recalculating at the same time. What if everybody in the city is making wrong turns and it's recalculating at the same time? What if everybody in the world? So we make good decisions. We make bad decisions. God's outside of time. He readjusts every electron in the universe so that his will is going to take place. So that we get to have our free will but he's still in control of everything because he is outside of time. People say God knows the future. In a sense, he knows all the possible futures. And he tells you what they are. And he lets you choose. And he even tells you how to choose. And he's smart enough to know how you are going to choose. But you look at Deuteronomy 28. Blessings, cursings. If you hearken to the voice of the Lord, this will be your future. You'll be the head and not the tail. Bless coming in, bless going out. If you do not hearken to the voice of the Lord, this will be your future. The diseases of Egypt will come upon you. The stranger will come in amongst you, rise up above you. Jeremiah goes to Zedekiah, or excuse me, prophet Jeremiah goes to King Zedekiah and says, here's a choice. If you surrender to the king of, king of Babylon, this will be the future. Jerusalem will be spared. If you do not surrender to the king of Babylon, this will be your future. Jerusalem will be burnt to the ground. So the choice is there. We make it, but God, God can recalculate everything. And so he goes, Mordecai goes to Esther. So there's a, there's a mandate to kill the Jews. If you remain silent, God will raise up somebody else to deliver the Jews. In other words, God's going to get his will done. If you yield to it, he's got a path, right? 30, 60, and 100 fold. He's, he's got, he, you are his workmanship prepared to do. He's got the good path. You walk in and submit to him. But if you, if you say no, he's going he's gonna to get his will done. You just you have to do it through somebody else. So God created us as free will beings. 
that have the ability to love God back. He created time, so we have our free will, but he is still in control of everything. There's a third thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his unlimited, omnipotent, eternal, omniscient, total power, awesomeness, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet as dead. I mean, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns. It'd be like Daniel, I was astonished for two weeks. <laughs> so God has to hide himself behind his creation in order for us to have a free will. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself in all of his power, your free will's gone. I mean, in the presence of all power and all love, irresistible love, terrible power. If he were to reveal it to you, it'd be involuntary. And God's like, I can do involuntary all eternity long. He is completely awesome. He says, I don't, I'm not interested in the involuntary. I'm interested in this voluntary thing, the voluntary love. So he has to hide himself. So people say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will is gone. It would be an involuntary response. And the same hiding of himself that allows us to have free will necessitates that we have faith. The hymn, uh, it is well with my soul, there's a line in there that says, Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. So we're on the other side. We don't have the sight, so we have to be in faith. <clears throat> I was trying to think of a way of explaining it, how God has to hide himself in order for us to love him back, for the love to be love, so that we're not just involuntarily responding. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college. He flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, got $40,000 Rolex watch, fancy clothes, gold rings. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside and drives up in a clunker, he's got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library and they eat together in the cafeteria. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy, but she believes in him. They fall in love, they get engaged. And then one day he says, hey, I, I wanna take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion estate and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. If Jesus would have come in his glory, every political ladder climber, I love you, I'm your friend. No, he's born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there's nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us as free will beings with the ability to love him back. He creates time, so he's still in control. He hides himself so that we have the opportunity to use our free will. But there's a last thing. He's just, and he cannot help it. He's just which means he has to judge every sin. In mathematical equations, there are constants and variables. The constant in the equation of redemption is God is just, was, is, and forever will be just. The variable is who takes the judgment. You are a substitute. God has to judge every sin, because if he does not judge a sin, by default, his silence would be giving consent to the sin. Like in a wedding ceremony, if you're silent, you're giving consent. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven, and he is not going to get kicked out of heaven, and he is not going to deny himself, and he is going to judge every sin. So he can never be loved back. Because if he creates free will beings that can love him back, creates time so he's still in control, hides himself so that we can use our free will. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us because if he doesn't judge our sin, his silence will be giving consent to the sin. If he gives consent to sin, he denies his not just nature. He denies himself and he cannot deny himself. So he could never be loved back until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son 
would become a man. And only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? So God is just and that he judges every sin, but he's love and that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have the ram up in the bush, but the others, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. The Apostle Paul called it a hidden plan, hidden from the foundations of the world. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus, the Son of God, became man, became the Lamb of God, and took the judgment of a just God upon himself in our place. You know, I was reading the book of Revelation. I've read it a thousand times, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's God that is pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Right? Lamb breaks the seal. Angel throws the center. Angel blows the trumpet. It's like, why is it? Well, that's the final judge. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So, so you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was this sin way back when, and, and you didn't judge it, and you were silent. W were you giving consent to that sin? Is, is there a party that's unjust we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. He won't do any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross, experienced it as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. He is the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb. And he took the wrath of God that we deserved upon himself on the cross. Isaiah 53 says it pleased the Lord to crush him. And then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, omnipotent, all-powerful, and all-just God and not have to worry about being judged because all the judgment we deserve went on Christ. The Lamb was God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. He came up with it. It says the lamb slain for the foundations of the world. It was God's plan so he could love you for the rest of eternity and you could love him back for the rest of eternity and not have to worry about being judged because all the judgment you deserve went on Christ. And you are approaching God in Christ. You're covered with his blood. You have his name on your forehead. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit comes in you and loves the world through you. So instead of you doing good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you are already accepted by God through faith in the blood of the lamb that he provided. And the Holy Spirit is doing the good works through you. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. 
And through you, he loves the unlovable, clothes the naked, feed the hungry, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death. Right? You get to let the God of the universe dwell on the inside of you as the temple of the Holy Ghost, and that you get to let God love people through you. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So tonight, the God who created time, who adjusts every electron, arranged it for you to be here tonight so that you could hear his love for you and how he made the way where you can love him back and it's not based on you being good enough. You will never be judged because all the judgment you deserve went on Christ. So tonight, God draw you, drew you here. And I'd like us to close with a prayer. So let's close our eyes and come before the Lord and just say this prayer under your breath. Heavenly Father, thank you for creating the universe. Thank you for creating me. I've sinned against you. I deserve judgment, but I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and take all the judgment I deserve upon himself. Jesus, I thank you that you did die on the cross, that you shed your blood in my place and you rose from the dead. I believe that. I confess you as my Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come in me. Live in me. Love through me. Care for others through me. Give me courage to stand up where you want me to stand up for you. I'm yours. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Jeff.